Alrighty, let's begin. So, uh, we've been talking about parallel databases and distributing databases. Uh, we diverged in the last few weeks into, uh, or the last few lectures into dealing with transactions and dealing with updates. Now let's uh, focus a bit on the complete other end of the spectrum. Uh, so what happens when you have a huge amount of data and you need to be able to analyze that data uh, effectively. Uh, but before that, a uh, couple of quick announcements. Uh, just a reminder, uh, Project 3, the first time trial, will be this Wednesday. Uh, anything submitted Wednesday night uh, will be tested. Uh, if fewer than five people submit, everyone, gets, uh, everyone who completes the test successfully uh, gets bonus points. Um, Homework 7 will be assigned tonight, it will be due next Monday. And um, for anyone who downloaded uh, Project 3 up to this point, um, several people have noted, noted that uh, there are a couple of ambiguities in the queries, um, in particular for, the pars uh, for parsers that don't support um, a priority order, the correct priority order on uh, the query on expression parsing. Um, the queries I posted won't work properly. So um, there have been clarified uh, TTCH queries post, posted as well. Um, those were posted last week, so if you haven't already, uh, if you got those, then, then you got those. Um, okay, so on to, uh, on to today's subject, uh, data warehouse. So uh, as I said, the, uh, the, the main focus of data warehousing is dealing with data, uh, dealing with vast amounts of data, and, and in particular, uh, analyzing that data and, and trying to extract some useful content out of it. Um, just natively, uh, 10 petabytes of, of data are, are, are relatively useless to you unless you can actually uh, find some interesting uh, features of that data. Uh, there might be uh, two or three rows that actually uh, make make an impact uh, in the, in that uh, ten petabytes of data. You might be looking for two specific rows of data, uh, and the what we're going to talk about today is is various strategies uh, for helping you find those, specifically from a data management perspective. Um, so just to give you sort of a, a big idea of of how data warehousing how data warehousing works. Uh, usually it goes in three stages. So you start off with data coming from a variety of different sources. Uh, these can be uh, traditional transaction processing systems. So uh, retailers like Amazon or uh, Walmart will typically have some sort of transaction processing system that keeps track of all of the, the sort of most recent data. Uh, but as soon as uh, every day or so, they'll, they'll gather information from this transaction processing system and, and pull it in for analysis. Um, this can also include things like uh, logging Twitter feeds. This can log, uh, include uh, things like uh, tax records. Basically, every, every little piece of information that might be possibly relevant to your analysis uh, constitutes an external data source. And the first step, and probably one of the most expensive steps in the process of analyzing uh, this data, is to actually read in all of that data and get it into some sort of common, uh, consistent format. And this is typically referred to as the extract, transform, and load process. Uh, for uh, First, you need to uh, connect to each of these external data sources. You need to be able to actually read uh, data out of those sources, uh, parse whatever format the, the data source is using, uh, connect to uh, the, the web socket, uh, what have you. Uh, transform, so the, the data source is not necessarily going to be in the schema that you're expecting. You, if you want to query the data, you want to have some sort of consistent, um, recognizable schema for that data. And if the, the data isn't already in, in that format, which more than likely it won't be, uh, you're, you might need to apply some transformations to that data to make it consistent, to, to get it into some sort of consistent uh, form. And then finally, once all of the data has been transformed, it actually has to be imported into the database. Uh, 
so in order to efficiently query it, you have to do things like build indices, uh, even just getting it out. Uh, if, you, if you're loading in a petabyte of data, even just getting it out to, uh, to all of the machines uh, where that petabyte of data is going to be actually processed, that's pretty expensive. So this is pretty much one of the big challenges in, in data warehousing. How do you do extract, transform, and load more efficiently? So once that uh, happens, you have yourself a, a big data warehouse. Um, the term data warehouse has been used to describe a, a pretty broad range of, of topics, but we've basically settled on a, a, a simple definition where uh, it, it basically unifies all, uh, a data warehouse sort of unifies all of the data sources uh, that, that you have access to in some common, with some common schema, and some uh, simple uh, mechanism for analysis. Once the, uh, the data is in the data warehouse, you actually have to make use of it. So um, one of the things we're gonna focus on mostly today is the process of querying that data. So what kind of uh, tricks can you pull to actually analyze the data once it's in the data warehouse? Um, this typically falls into, uh, queries on a data warehouse typically fall into two categories. Um, so there's data mining, which is uh, sort of analyzing the data in, in a big data set for uh, interesting statistical patterns. So um, finding interesting patterns in the data, correlating different data sources, um, that falls into the data mining category. If you're interested in that, uh, we have a whole class uh, here at UB on data mining. Uh, I'm going to ignore that and focus more on uh, something called OLAP queries. And this is a, a query, a style of queries that's somewhat related to SQL. In fact, a lot of SQL engines will uh, support uh, various OLAP query functionality, um, but it, it's, it's sort of a, a specialized form of, of query processing. So what we're going to focus on today mostly is uh, how to, uh, what exactly an OLAP query is and what are some interesting strategies uh, for processing OLAP queries. So uh, just to be clear, uh, Data Warehouse basically brings in huge amounts of data. Uh, we're talking uh, a couple of years back, basically you'd be talking about data warehouses in the gigabyte range, maybe terabyte. Now, companies like Google, uh, Amazon, uh, Facebook, basically their entire data set is, is essentially a data warehouse, and so we're, we're talking petabytes or even more of, of data. And really the, the two main workload characteristics of a database is, first off, uh, the data changes infrequently. So uh, usually you'll, you won't update data in a data warehouse just arbitrarily. You, won't, uh, you don't update a data warehouse every single time a customer places an order on Amazon. Um, the, the updates to the data warehouse are, are far more structured. So you can batch updates, you can organize them and, and manage them uh, much more efficiently because you don't need this sort, of, uh, this, this sort of immediate response to your updates. On the other hand, um, the, the goal of an OLAP uh, workload is essentially, it, well, OLAP stands for Online Analytics Processing. Um, you want to ask questions about your data, and when you ask questions about your data, you want an immediate response. Um, now, I mean, this, this varies. Uh, for, uh, for some queries, you know, uh, response times of, of hours or more can, can happen, but ideally, in, in an OLAP workload, you want uh, to give the, the, query, the, the person querying the data, the person analyzing the data, uh, a response time as, as quickly as possible. And so we're gonna talk uh, today about uh, some, some strategies for providing exact answers immediately. And then in the next couple of lectures, we'll also talk about um, strategies such as uh, approximate query answering and um, online query processing. Uh, so to give you sort of a, a, a high-level picture of what kind of challenges uh, are, are faced in data warehousing, um, I already mentioned in, in some fairly extensive depth, uh, when you're warehousing data, um, you want that data to be in some sort of consistent, easily understood, easily uh, managed format. So uh, 
the, the, the just loading the data into the database is extremely expensive and can take on the order of hours or even days, depending on the size of your warehouse. Um, one of the other major challenges is, is that the data is not necessarily in some sort of uniform uh, representation. And here I'm not just talking about schemas, but um, uh, to use myself as an example, uh, I could be referred to as Oliver, I could be referred to as Oliver Kennedy, I could be referred to as O Kennedy, Kennedy comma O. Uh, these are all reasonable ways of identifying the entity that is me. And um, if, a, if a data warehouse is unifying multiple different uh, data sources, each of those data sources might have a different way of characterizing um, different entities. Um, and something that's also becoming increasingly important is that it's necessary to keep track of where the data came from. And so something we'll talk about uh, hopefully a bit later in the month is this idea of provenance. So how do you um, track where the data came from? Um, and when you uh, ask questions about the data, how do you figure out uh, what source data contributed to that answer. Uh, those of you in um, the data integration class will have already encountered this. Um, okay, so how do we actually represent data in a data warehouse? Well, there are two general strategies. The first, is, well, so from a high level, the, the, the thing that you're trying to store is a collection of numeric measures. Um, and you want to organize those numeric measures uh, along a set of dimensions. Uh, you can think of the dimensions as keys. So this is what we'd like to, um, the, e each dimension identifies some property of every record uh, that we can ask questions about, uh, such as the time that the record uh, was, uh, was inserted, uh, the location corresponding to that record, uh, maybe the part uh, corresponding to that record, and the, every record will also track one or more uh, numeric measures. So for example, um, we might track for every part, for every time, and for every location uh, the volume of sales for that particular uh, intersection of those three dimensions. Um, so for example, uh, for part 12, time I, the time with identity 12, and location 1, uh, 20 units were sold. So you can think of this as sort of this really big multi-dimensional space. Um, or, uh, as, as is uh, more, more typically the representation, uh, you can unroll that multi-dimensional array or matrix into uh, a single dimensional array, uh, which basically just stores the everything as uh, a sequence of, of values. Um, now this particular representation is most commonly referred to as the multi-dimensional uh, online aggregation processing system, um, or uh, where all of the data is basically stored in a big array of values. Now there's a bit of a downside to this in that every single, uh, storing everything as, as one big array means that all of the data has to be um, Every row has to store every single value. And we haven't talked about normalized forms uh, yet, but the, the basic idea is that a lot of the data is going to be repeated. So for example, if, um, if I want to make a distinction between times that happen in the same month, I need to store now two columns uh, for the time in this particular representation. So uh, there's a, a slightly generalized form of this that makes it a little bit easier to query, uh, known as the relational lab. Um, now the idea here is that you have a central table which stores uh, what's known as a, a central fact table, which stores every single record. So the fact table is analogous to, to this array. Uh, every single value that you'd like to track, to record, uh, goes into that fact table. But now, rather than having individual data values for each uh, record, you, you break out uh, each record into a, a sort of summary of
So each dimension is now identified, uh, identifies a row in what's known as a dimension table. And the dimension tables uh, each provide additional metadata about the, the characteristics of that dimension. So let me give you a little bit of an example here. Uh, a fact table might track the sales of a set of products uh, given a particular location and for a set of times. So our fact table is going to, uh, is going to contain uh, tuples of the form uh, part ID, time ID, location ID, and, and uh, sales for that particular uh, triple of, of identifiers. Now we have three dimensions. We have uh, the times, we have the products, and we have the locations. And so we can break, uh, create a, um, we can create dimension tables uh, that store, uh, for example, uh, which time IDs, uh, for each time ID, which day that corresponds to, and we can then even uh, subdivide those even further, uh, for example, saying which week that date corresponds to, which month, which quarter, year, and, uh, for example, whether that date corresponds to a holiday. And for those of you, uh, well, we'll get into normal forms again in a couple of lectures, but um, for those of you already familiar with it, um, that we're essentially uh, normalizing the the the, sale, the the fact table, uh, but the, the dimension tables are still going to be stored unnormalized. Um, this is a fairly common schema in OLAP, enough that uh, people have given it its own name. And because you have this sort of central fact table with a bunch of dimension tables branching out from it, this is typically referred to as the star schema. Um, Right, so you might notice that the, the dimension tables, there's, there's sort of a relationship between uh, the, the various columns in, in the, the dimension table. So for example, we can say, uh, given a particular date, we know which week that falls into. A week essentially consists of multiple days. Similarly, a month uh, consists of multiple days. And a quarter consists of multiple weeks, but it also consists of multiple months. And a year consists of multiple quarters. We can actually, uh, essentially what I'm trying to get at is that each dimension, um, and specifically the dimension table, uh, we can use the columns of that dimension table uh, to establish a sort of hierarchy over the data. So for example, the part, uh, a category consists of many parts, or a location, um, uh, a country consists of multiple states, which consists of multiple cities. And we can actually use this while trying to analyze the data. And this is pretty much one of the, the, the founding ideas of, of OLAP, and uh, most of the concepts we'll be dealing with today. Um, so OLAP queries are, uh, as I said, they're, they're sort of uh, connected to SQL. In fact, most uh, SQL query processors will allow you to, to do OLAP in some form. Um, they're, they're sort of influ influenced both by SQL and by various operations that are, are somewhat common in uh, spreadsheet programs. Actually, the uh, um, one of the driving forces behind OLAP uh, was Excel, ironically. Um, now, the, the most common operation, uh, OLAP queries are, are basically built mostly around aggregates. You have huge amounts of data, petabytes of data. No human is going to sift through a petabyte of data. You want some way of summarizing all of that data in some concrete way. And the most direct way that we have of doing that is the aggregate. So for example, you might be interested in uh, the overall total sales throughout every single uh, city, location, and date. Uh, maybe we're interested in the total sales uh, for a particular city. Or you know, maybe that's a little too much data, so now we want to zoom out and, and uh, get the total sales for each state. Um, maybe we want the top five products by, by sales. So again, the, the, the challenge here is to find, um, to compute aggregates and to do interesting things with those aggregates. And so there are basically four operations in OLAP. Um, and the first of the, the first two of these, I should say, are roll up and drill down. So starting from uh, any, any aggregate, let's say the, uh, the sum of all sales, 
uh, roll up and drill down give you a sort of way of uh, man uh, maneuvering through uh, different representations of the data. So if I say drill down, I can pick one of those hierarchies that I described, one of these hierarchies, and I can say I want to drill down into uh, one of these hierarchies. So let's say I have the total, excuse me, the total sales uh, over everything, and that's a single number. I can say I want to drill down into country. And so now, essentially what I'm, I'm doing there is I'm specifying I'd like to get an aggregate, but grouped by country. And then from that point, I have a, an aggregate grouped by country. I can either say I'm going to drill down into uh, the location hierarchy again, in which case now I get a result grouped by state. Or I can also say I want to drill down uh, on the, the time. So I want to drill down uh, into year. So now I get, essentially this is a way of maneuvering through the set of group by queries uh, that you're getting, uh, that are being displayed at any given point in time. So you start off with one aggregate and you can sort of move through different group by terms uh, using these two operations. Drill down is going to go down one level of, uh, of the hierarchy and roll up is going to move uh, up one level of the hierarchy. Does that, any questions on this? All right. Uh, so basically, this is this is the the heart of OLAP. These two operations. Um, the two other operations are going to be pivoting, which is going to give you a, um, a sort of cross tabulation view of the data, like this, uh, and slice and dice, uh, which where you basically specify a predicate to apply to the data and. Um, Essentially, that gives you a selection of the group by predicate over one or more dimensions. Uh, so, for example, you could do slice and dice. Uh, you could slice uh, 2000, uh, 2011, and you would end up with just this row of the data. Um, okay, so have a look at this, this cross tabulation. How, how would you go about uh, constructing a, a cross tabulation like this in SQL? So let's say you have a big, huge data set. It has umpteen different columns, uh, two of which are year and state. So how would you get uh, the information in this table? Yeah. Some that it has uh, these um, special uh, um, keywords to do that. For example, uh, cube. Or cube? Yeah, cube. Um, hold that thought for about 30 seconds. Just, uh, act, you're, you, uh, you're on to the correct answer. Um, you're actually uh, going one step, uh, one step further in the answer than, than I was expecting. Um, uh, 30 seconds. Um, the, uh, so the, uh, how would you specifically get, so w what kind of queries would you need to, to get these, these, uh, okay, so an aggregate query, uh, specifically, or what, what some, um, group by, group by, thank you. Um, okay, so, uh, how would I get, let's say, these cells? Group by year and state, how would I get these cells? Some over, well, some, but uh, so all, all of these are sums, but how would I get uh, specifically these cells? Group by state, and similarly. Uh, so group by state, group by date, and then group by nothing. So, uh, answer that. Um, so, generalizing from this, how many different possible uh, let's say I wanted to create the, the most general cross tabulation uh, possible. How could I? How would I? Or how many different uh, group by queries could I actually ask about that uh, about that table if I had k dimensions? Group by k. Group by. Sorry. K minus one. K. Y k minus one. Sorry? So here we had um, two dimensions. 
two dimensions and we got, we had one, two, three, four group by queries. If we add a uh, third one, how, uh, third dimension, come out at the screen. I can't do 3D, unfortunately. But, um, so I'd, we'd have still the, the sort of body, and then we'd have, um, we'd have to do, uh, sorry, uh, imagine this rotated uh, 90 degrees out. So you, basically each of these, there'd be sort of a, a, a group of, of queries here, and then you'd have to sum up over all of those as well. So essentially, uh, you, but, so, uh, so this is, this is a, a um, any, any thoughts? Okay, so uh, that, that particular structure. Um, let's, uh, let's address this in a different way. Um, okay, so this has, uh, you're grouping by both of the, the two that are, are present. Here you're grouping by one of the two, here you're grouping by a different one of the two, and here you're grouping by neither. So for each of these, you're basically, you, you have two decisions to make. Two power k. Two power k, thank you. So you have two decisions, right, uh, just to, to uh, yeah, so basically you have two to the power k uh, different possible group by queries. Now that's a huge number, but, as you say, uh, the there's a operator in SQL called cube, which is sort of a, a uh, power set uh, power set group by uh, operator. So for all of the two to the k different dimensions that you could get group by terms for, uh, the cube operator is going to create an aggregate for ev uh, is going to essentially compute all of those two to the k different group by aggregates. And in particular, the cube operator is mainly, uh, I mean, this is not something you'd evaluate just as a you know, random, I, I would like the cube of this, this particular, uh, I would like to analyze the cube of this uh, data set. The cube operator is typically used uh, primarily to uh, pre-build that data structure so that when you actually need one of those group by queries, uh, they're available. And this essentially creates all of them. Um, so to make this uh, a little more concrete, if you had a select query uh, where in place of the group by term, you'd actually said uh, cube uh, PID, loc ID, time ID by uh, some sales, or select some sales cube uh, by PID, loc ID, time, uh, depending on which processor you're using, uh, you'd essentially get back uh, a query that contained all, uh, so there are Three different, uh, three different dimensions here. So there are essentially eight, two to the two to the third, or eight different possible group by queries you can form out of that. Um, and this, uh, what you get back is a table that contains all of those results. How would you go about uh, representing that in in SQL? So what's the first problem? Let's uh, what's uh, how would you represent uh, in a single data set uh, both also group by everything and group by nothing? Is there is there sort of an immediate problem that uh, that pops out? So we, we mentioned. So is there a, a obvious 
problem? Uh, is there any sort of obvious problem uh, between using these two representations? The first one returns all the records. Returns all of the results. Okay. Or more. Uh, what what would go if in the first one I do something like this? I actually care about. Uh, whereas in this case, would I do that? No. So, is that a problem? <clears throat> Let's say I wanted to return them all in one data set. Is there a problem with doing that in this case? So, what would the scheme of that data set be? Group by should be applied on one, one column. Hmm? Sorry? Group by should be applied on one column. So, aggregate operator should be applied on one. No, you can, you can group by as many columns as you like. At least one. At least one, yeah. Which is why I cross out group by in that case. Um, What if I were to just do that? Could I combine these two into a single data set? No. Why? Scheme is different, exactly. Um, so essentially what the cube operator is going to do is it actually does one of the biggest hacks uh, imaginable, but it does, it, what it does essentially is to create um, null values for each of these. So whatever columns are not present in the group by, uh, are going to be turned into nulls. So you essentially end up with one big data set, uh, but with null values in just the right places to get uh, every single um, every single aggregate in the, the full uh, pivot table. Uh, okay, so this is something of an expensive operation. Um, given time, I might talk a little bit more about how uh, cubes can be implemented a little more efficiently. Um, off the top of your heads, is there um, what kind? Uh, are, are there any strategies you can possibly think of to uh, make, make this a little more efficient? Or how, how would you go about uh, if you were trying to implement the cube operator in the most efficient way possible? How would you go about doing that? So would you evaluate all uh, two to the k queries <coughs> independently? No, the answer is no. But, uh, do the last one first, and then group them, group them one by one. Okay, so uh, typically the way that... Uh, I'm going to uh, rephrase that slightly. So typically the way that uh, the cube operator gets implemented is that you're going to pick um, one hierarchy, and you're going to... Uh, sorry, you're, you're going to pick one, um, one group by term you're going to sort everything based on all three of these. And you're going to keep, in fact, three separate group by aggregates going at any given point in time. So you're going to have the full uh, sum of all sales. But then at any given point in time, you're also going to be computing uh, everything grouped by PID, everything grouped by location, PID and location ID, and uh, everything grouped by PID, location ID, and time ID. And because these are going to be, uh, because you're scanning them in sorted order, uh, you can essentially just, uh, you only have to keep four aggregates in memory at any given point in time. You can build the entire thing uh, using a single scan, uh, or that entire structure using a single scan. You still need multiple scans, but you can, you can do, uh, cut out a whole bunch of, of scans by overlapping work. Um, one other strategy is to note that not all of these dimensions are going to be um, are going to be interesting. Uh, so, for example, uh, let's go back to the let's say that we expand one of these dimensions out. Let's say we want um, the the time ID to be expanded out into um, date and month. 
So now we have two columns here. And potentially that means we have twice as many uh, group I aggregates that we have to, to build up. But it usually doesn't make sense to uh, aggregate for both month and date. Uh, so if you're aggregating by month uh, and date, that's essentially equivalent to just aggregating by date, right? So, um, I mean, every date belongs to one specific month, so you're never going to have more than one group, uh, one month group for every date. So you can take advantage of the, the sort of hierarchical structure uh, to, to minimize how many uh, expressions you need to uh, materialize. Okay, um, so that's the cube operator. Uh, given time permitting, we'll return to that in a bit. Um, or time permitting, we'll return to that in a, a week or two. Uh, give you a little more, uh, let's see what else. So one other thing I want to talk about today is this idea of uh, bitmap, bitmap indices. Um, so we're talking about petabytes of data. And when we're talking about petabytes of data, um, even the smallest performance improvements can have a huge impact on how long it takes to evaluate a query. Um, and one example of that, uh, quick show of hands who's uh, taken computer architecture, or at least who, uh, a quick show of hands, uh, who uh, recognizes the phrase pipeline stall? Oh, okay, there's a couple of people, but. Um, okay, so uh, basically in a, in a CPU, um, If it, uh, a CPU that's evaluating an if statement, essentially, is going to need to figure out which instruction to process next. And if it's making that decision, um, usually it has to make this decision uh, a couple of, of cycles before it's actually relevant. So a, uh, it will usually pick at random to decide to evaluate. Uh, Either the, the if statement evaluates to the if clause, or it'll choose the then clause, uh, according to some heuristics. Uh, but if it chooses incorrectly, then essentially it's just wasted uh, 10 to 20 cycles of processing. Um, and there's a whole bunch of ways around that, but uh, long story short, as soon as you have an if statement in your code, um, that could potentially take, uh, that could potentially be very expensive. And if you're repeating that if statement over every row of, of two petabytes of data, you're talking already about hours of compute time. So uh, one, one question we'd like to ask is, can we, when we're computing these aggregates, uh, can we do so using, uh, without involving if statements, just using pure arithmetic? Um, and so the, the, the general strategy that people have come up with, or one, one strategy, is to uh, use what's known as a bitmap index. Um, right. So we're going to break up every single data value. Uh, we're going to build an, in, an additional index column, a bitmap index column, uh, which is going to tell, uh, which is going to um, express. So for example, uh, in, in a simplistic view, there are two genders. Uh, there are two possible uh, bits for that gender. Um, and for females, we're going to set bit one. And for males, we're going to set bit two. There's, uh, if there's a rating, that rating has five possible values. Uh, we're going to have a five bit bit vector. Uh, for rating five, we're going to set bit one. For rating four, we're going to set bit two. Uh, bit 4, bit 8, and bit 16 uh, for progressively lower rank ratings. And so now, if we want to uh, find the sum of all sales uh, where, where the gender is, let's say, male, and the rating is 5, we can compute that uh, without any sort of if statements by taking the bitwise, uh, the bitwise and of the gender field and that, that one bit and using bit shifts to essentially move that one into, into the first position. Once we've done that, basically we can, we can use bit operations essentially uh, to find, uh, to, to 
create a value that's either 0 or 1, depending on whether uh, the predicate is satisfied. And then if we multiply the sales by that, then we get either 0, in which case adding 0 to uh, the total does nothing. But basically, th this formula is either going to compute 0, evaluate to 0 if the predicate is, uh, is not satisfied, or it will evaluate to 1 if the predicate is satisfied. And so 1 times sales increments the total by the sales, which is what we want if the predicate is satisfied. Uh, 0 times sales is zero, uh, 0, which has no effect on the total. And again, that's exactly the, the behavior that we want. Um, any questions on this? A little bit weird. So one other uh, benefit to this particular strategy is that we can use it to summarize uh, sequences of rows. So for example, uh, if we have a data set that, uh, if, if we partition our data, uh, recall we used this, uh, this uh, what do you call it, uh, bloom filter, uh, these bloom filters to figure out uh, which tuples were present on a particular server. So we can do something similar here. Uh, if we take the bitwise or of all of the rows, we can figure out which um, values are matched by that particular uh, set. We essentially have a summary that tells us, so in this case, if we take the bitwise or of all of these, uh, we know that this data set contains both males and females. If we take the bitwise or of these, we know that um, only that this data set contains uh, entries of ranks 3, 4, and 5, uh, but no entries of ranks uh, 1 or 2. Is that clear? All right. Uh, I, I see some confused non, uh, confused. All right, well, uh, if, so basically we, taking that summary, we know essentially which ratings uh, are present in this particular data set. We know which genders are present in this particular data set. And so we can use that to filter out uh, if we, let's say, have our, our data partitioned over a large cluster, we can figure out, uh, use, use, we can use that data to uh, figure out immediately which partitions we can exclude from our query uh, just by the fact that um, they don't, well, let's say we were looking for uh, rating one, we could keep around a, a summary of, of the bitwise or of all of these, and we'd know that rating one, that none of the tuples have a rating of one, because the bitwise or of, of all of those uh, doesn't have uh, a one in that field. OK. Um, So one other, one other area that we're going to bring up either Wednesday or Friday is this idea of join indices. So in addition to, to using bitmap indices to help us uh, or compute aggregates more efficiently, uh, we can also keep, essentially build up an index of, we can build up indices of which values, um, which, uh, excuse me, which rows in the fact which rows in the fact table uh, satisfy specific predicates. Uh, so for example, if we're looking for uh, all sales happening in the US, then we essentially want to know which rows in the fact table uh, correspond to that or satisfy that particular predicate. Now we can do this in a couple of different ways. Uh, we can either sort of index all of the, the uh, triples in the fact table itself, um, which is useful, but it's, it's potentially quite expensive. Uh, or we can simply index uh, just the, the row ID of the fact table. Um, essentially keep the uh, insert into the index uh, the, the value that we're indexing as well as the, uh, the row ID that uh, match, uh, maps to the fact table. Um, we're running a little low on time, so I'm going to hold off on this. Uh, we will. This this is 
This is essentially the foundation uh, for uh, an area of databases called column stores, which um, I believe we'll be getting into either uh, Wednesday or Friday. Uh, let me finish up with one quick uh, additional piece of information. Uh, so sequences are also an important feature of uh, in data warehouses. Um, in particular, when we're trying to analyze trends, we need to know how data is, uh, is changing over time. Uh, so for example, we, we might want to know what, how the monthly sales have changed, uh, how monthly cha sales have changed over time. Uh, we might want to find the uh, top five uh, product sales in a given, uh, in the given week, uh, but for every day. And we might want to know um, the, uh, we might want to know, uh, let's say, a moving average of the sales. And this is something that, the, the first of these two examples are, are things that you can do in, in traditional SQL, using the, the query, uh, SQL that we've discussed so far. Uh, but it's extremely difficult to do so. Um, and the third one is just flat out impossible. So in SQL 99, uh, they introduced uh, a clause called uh, window, which is a sort of a, a variation of uh, a, a, another variant aggregate query, which allows us to compute aggregates over uh, sequences of, of information. So the window operation is going to start by defining a sequence uh, and a sort over a particular relation. And it will essentially give us all subsequences of a particular size and it, allow, it will allow us uh, to compute some aggregate values uh, over that subsequence. Uh, we'll get a little more into this when we talk about stream queries uh, next week or so. Uh, but just to give you a sort of a sense of the flavor of this, uh, it's a query just as before, but the aggregates are annotated with uh, a window. The window is specified uh, in terms of an order, on the data and in terms of a range. So this basically tells us that each window, it will generate one window uh, for every row in the data, but that window will contain um, all of the tuples that appear either one month before the specified date or one month after the specified date. Um, we can also specify partitions. Uh, so this is analogous to the group by, uh, this, is an, this is analogous uh, to the group by clause of a normal aggregate query. Uh, except in this case, we're going to still generate multiple outputs. Uh, so it uh, will generate essentially one, um, we will window over each, uh, generate a separate window over everything in this partition by clause. So for example, we'll have one window for each state. Um, any, any questions on this? All right, well, uh, that's about it. Um, a lot of this is going to be basically introduction for upcoming, uh, upcoming lectures. So we're going to talk a bit more about column stores, stream processors. And with that, thanks a lot. And uh, see you Wednesday.